In this week's Cold Boot, we'll be discussing LG attempting to bribe multiple YouTubers, as well as upset Apple fans post WWDC. We also have several other stories, and the best part of all is that I'm sick, so you'll likely get to hear what sounds like a grown man's voice for this video rather than an 11 year old that hasn't yet hit puberty. Let's hit that power button. It's time to cold boot. Welcome back. It's Poe back again with Let's Get Techie. On the first partition of today's episode, unfortunately, Hardware Unboxed has yet again found themselves in the crosshairs of a very ill-mannered marketing department. Not too long ago, it came to light that NVIDIA was attempting to blacklist the YouTube channel for their refusal to align with how NVIDIA wanted a particular review to be produced. Well, this time around, it's another industry giant, LG. Hardware Unbox has long been famous for their spectacular monitor reviews and has worked with LG CNS, the marketing arm for LG, for quite a long time. Unfortunately, this time around, the representative from LG CNS actually requested in an email that Hardware Unbox submit their script for review prior to releasing the video. On top of that, they also advised that should they disagree with anything in the script, they would then compensate Hardware Unbox if they asked them to change anything in the review. Is this real life? LG had to have seen the nightmare that happened from NVIDIA attempting to bully YouTubers last year. Independent of the NVIDIA scandal, is this how LG CNS employees are being trained? Not only could it technically be illegal depending on the exact circumstances, but it's just morally wrong to try and implement a process like this. The reason we're concerned this isn't just a one-off is because Hardware Unbox showed the email correspondence and there were upwards of five LG CNS employees copied on the emails back and forth, meaning several people at LG's marketing arm were well aware that this was being asked of an independent reviewer. It's also worth noting that at the time of writing this script, at least one additional YouTuber has come forward stating they've received the same treatment from LG regarding their reviews. Let us know your thoughts down in the comments on this. Is it not quite as bad when you know that it's technically a subsidiary of LG and not the mammoth company itself? Or do you feel like LG is still responsible regardless since they've entrusted LG CNS with carrying out the marketing aspects of their company? On the second partition of today's cold boot, Apple just had their 2021 WWDC event and to power users dismay we saw no pro level apps ported to the iPad via the iPad OS 15 update. This has been long rumored and honestly probably something Apple fans should just give up on at this point. Everyone was sure this time around with Apple putting the M1 in the iPad Pro that we would see software such as Logic and Final Cut Pro running on the tablet. What the grumpy Apple fans fail to realize is twofold. First, Apple never intends on the iPad being a replacement for the Mac. They see it as a device to complement the Mac. More on that in a second. Second, everyone is looking at the M1 being put in the iPad the wrong way. Many people are saying, but you put a desktop processor in the iPad, so why no desktop apps? The reality of this is the exact opposite, and technically speaking, they actually put an iPad processor in a desktop. Anyone who follows Apple knows that iPads have long gotten either the Z or X variant of the same A-series chip that powers iPhones. The people who don't seem to understand what's going on here are some of the same people who've called the M1 an A14 bionic on steroids. Well, what was an A12Z if not an A12 on steroids? To be fair, they did add some things that we wouldn't normally see in an iPad chip, such as Thunderbolt and x86 translation. But at its core, pun intended, it's still an iPad chip. Now back to what I mentioned a moment ago about Apple marketing the iPad as a complementary device to the Mac. If anyone ever doubted this, all doubt should now be erased after seeing Craig Federici show off the new universal control feature on stage at WWDC. This feature allows you to use your MacBook trackpad or iMac peripherals on the iPad via a smooth transition from one screen to the other as if by magic. This isn't a first. We've seen this before in third-party apps such as Logitech's Flow software. But as usual, Apple is late to the party but with the nicest bottle of brandy you've ever tasted. Needless to say, this is one feature that Apple showed off at the conference that did leave Apple Power users with a warm and fuzzy feeling on the inside. Maybe it wasn't slicing up a clip in Final Cut with an Apple Pencil on a new M1 iPad Pro, but unfortunately this is about as close as Apple customers will ever get to that alternate reality. Isn't it blatantly obvious now Apple sees the iPad as a complementary device to the Mac? One more quick note on Apple before moving on to Partition 2. This week, news emerged of an Apple-authorized repairer leaking sensitive customer data during a repair. If you haven't already heard about this, we'll let your mind wander on exactly what this sensitive data was. It wasn't their tax returns. 
If any of you are interested in the details of this story, check out Lewis Rossman's video on the topic. I'll link it below. On the third partition of today's episode, let's take a look at the new AMD-powered Strix G15 Advantage Edition laptop. AMD's been back in the game of powering laptops with their outstanding Ryzen 4000 and 5000 series CPUs, but thankfully they've finally come to compete in the mobile GPU market as well. If you want more information on that, feel free to check out our video on AMD's Computex keynote. Unfortunately though, it appears after initial praise from day one reviewers, the YouTube channel Jared's Tech has discovered some unfortunate build decisions that greatly hampers performance on this AMD Advantage branded laptop. For starters, in Jared's words, it appears Asus decided to use Max-Q RAM in this laptop. Now obviously this is a joke, but the performance is not. When swapping the factory RAM out for a performance kit of SODIMM RAM, the laptop saw a massive boost in Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p, going from 102 FPS on average to a whopping 135 FPS. The clobbering for the factory configuration doesn't stop there. NVIDIA uses their Optimus technology to switch between integrated GPU and the dedicated GPU when going from desktop use to gaming, but it appears Asus has not incorporated anything like this, such as a MUX switch, for this AMD-powered laptop. This sees performance dip even further unless you plug the laptop into an external monitor. All of this is very unfortunate, and what's worse is the vast majority of gamers who don't know the finer details of how a gaming laptop works will place the blame solely on AMD, when in actuality this was multiple bad decisions on the part of Asus. Although it does beg the question, with this being an AMD Advantage branded laptop, was this design not approved by AMD prior to it going into production? Let us know your thoughts down in the comments and whether or not this will sour you from giving AMD's new mobile GPUs a shot. On Partition 4, we're taking a look at how the new 3070 Ti was received amongst reviewers. Unfortunately, it was welcomed similarly to how the 3080 Ti was, with every review I saw personally stating the card was not worth the money. Again, it's not that the card doesn't provide good performance, but rather its price to performance is all out of whack, just like the 3080 Ti. In Gamers Nexus's review of the card, you can see the benchmarks are very much on par with the RX 6800 from AMD. There are a few that sway the advantage to Nvidia, and some that swing back in AMD's favor. It appears as with the rest of the RDNA 2 versus Ampere battle, AMD seems to get the better end of the stick at lower resolutions, while Nvidia pulls ahead at higher resolutions. I think the biggest point reviewers are trying to get across is not only that the RX 6800 is a better price to performance GPU, but the measly 8% on average the 3070 Ti holds over the vanilla 3070 for an additional $100 MSRP means literally no one should purchase this GPU. But... As we know, right now is absolutely not a buyer's market, so a lot of gamers will buy anything they can get their hands on, and that's exactly what NVIDIA and their board are banking on. This situation is very similar to what we described in last week's episode regarding the 3080 Ti. The new 3070 Ti shares the same GA104 die that we see on the vanilla 3070 as well as the 3060 Ti. This means that every GA104 die we see NVIDIA prioritize to this new 3070 Ti is one less die that could have been used to power the less expensive and better value 3060 Ti and 3070. NVIDIA knows that it's a seller's market and they can pretty much dump all of these dies into 3070 Ti production and they will still sell every single card. Next up on today's episode, we're finally getting to move away from all the negative topics and discuss something exciting for gamers. Well, some gamers at least. This week, DICE and EA announced their upcoming reboot of Battlefield. This time around, it'll be known as Battlefield 2042. As you can expect, this will take place in a future setting rather than harping back to previous world conflicts. And for a lot of Battlefield gamers, this is exciting news. Many prefer the more modern weaponry and gameplay. In our opinion, the trailer looks absolutely fantastic. It has an orbital class rocket in it, and who doesn't love an orbital rocket? But traditionalists may disagree completely. Not only do some gamers dislike the futuristic setting of forward-looking Battlefield games such as this, but there's one other drawback to potentially dislike very much, the omission of a single-player campaign mode. Based on the trailer, it doesn't look as though they went overboard with the futurism, but the lack of a single-player campaign mode will absolutely kill it for some gamers. Personally, I always play the campaign mode of games like this. Maybe it's because I'm older and my reaction time has slipped and I get tired of being owned by a 12-year-old in multiplayer. 
Whatever the reason, I'm anxious to see how the Battlefield audience feels about this as a whole and how sales of this new game pan out considering the lack of a campaign mode. Pre-orders for the game are live now with an expected release date of October 22nd for PC as well as both last and next generation consoles. If anyone can explain to me why there was a tornado at the end of the trailer, please drop a comment below because I have no idea what that was all about. Moving on to Partition 6, we've got some pretty sweet news from Samsung that nerds like myself who love new hardware will be stoked for. Samsung's been the biggest player when it comes to stacking NAND flash, and this week they've stated they're on track to introduce 176 layer VNAND devices. Additionally, according to Tom's hardware, they envision VNAND chips with more than 1,000 layers in the future. This new 176 layer NAND will be featured in upcoming PCIe 4.0 and 5.0 devices, and through the use of an all new controller optimized for multitasking huge workloads, these devices boast upwards of 2,000 mega transfers per second. If any of you are familiar with Samsung's 980 Pro NVMe drive, what we're talking about here will be the successor to that incredibly fast drive. These new drives should be absolute beasts. Whether you're teaching a neural network or trying to hit less than 6 seconds cold booting to your desktop, if you have the coin to drop, these will absolutely be the drives you want. Maybe this will usher in a new age where we start to see other components optimized to take advantage of these ultra-fast speeds and more mundane tasks. Consider what Xbox has done with Quick Resume on the new Series X and you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. The final partition of this episode is less of a news story and more of a PSA. As more than 200 million Amazon shoppers are aware, the infamous Prime Day is coming up on June 21st through the 22nd of this month. Prime Day sees massive discounts on Amazon branded products such as Fire Tablets and Ring Doorbells. However, what a good portion of the public doesn't realize is a lot of the non-Amazon branded products do see discounts during Prime Day. However, in many instances, these items aren't as steeply discounted as you may think. With the rise of quasi-holidays such as Black Friday and Cyber Monday, consumers are sometimes misled into the mindset of, this is such a good deal, I can't not buy it. We aren't saying there aren't some fantastic deals on Prime Day, as there absolutely are, and you better believe I'm going to be out there hunting for them myself. We just wanted to mention this to remind you to be a smart shopper. There are several YouTube channels dedicated to showing you what the best deals are on Prime Day, and the legitimate ones will include historical pricing data so you know if this double-bladed pineapple husker is really worth the $299 price tag. Additionally, there are platforms such as Camel 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 which track the price history of most products sold on Amazon. This can tell you if splurging on the pineapple thingy is a worthwhile purchase from a relativistic perspective. They even have a web extension called Camelizer that you can use to set alerts for specific products you're hoping may go on sale. This is a great way to snag a deal whether it's Prime Day or not as long as you're willing to wait it out. We want to hear from you down in the comments. Are you going to buy Battlefield 2042 or is the lack of a campaign mode taking it off your purchase list? Are there any items you're hoping to pick up on Prime Day this year? What do you think of the current state of Apple's ecosystem and were you hoping to get a pro level app on the new M1 iPad this year? We try to respond to every comment on every video, so give us a shout below. Unfortunately, that's going to bring us to the end of this week's episode. If you enjoyed it, please hit that like button and consider subscribing. If you're already subbed, don't forget to click the bell icon to get notified when our next video goes live. We appreciate you watching, and we will see you in the next one.